says that God inhabits the praises of his people. It's so easy to forget that though, man. We get in that situation, man, and we we forget, man, that all, all we need to do sometimes is just praise, just worship, just bow down, and guess what? Hallelujah. He saves me. Come on, church. We see this all over the Bible. Second Chronicles chapter 20. You have Judah being attacked and encamped. Three kings against one king, one nation, three on one. And God tells the king, you're not even going to have to fight this battle. I'll fight for you. Send the worship team ahead of the warriors. And the worship team led, which is ridiculous, but the worship team led the warriors in battle. And God did a miracle in that army. And they, they, even, they fought each other and killed each other. Joshua chapter 6, you guys know the story, the battle of Jericho. God tells Joshua, march around Jericho six times. And on the seventh time, you have your worship team again lead you, blow the trumpets, and shout with the voice of triumph, and those walls came crashing down. <laughs> Acts chapter 16, we see Paul and Silas in prison. They're in shackles, they're in a dungeon, you guys. And the Bible says that about midnight, they began singing hymns and praising God. And the presence of God fell in that jail cell, shook the doors open, broke every shackle, not only on Paul and Silas, but on every prisoner. So much so that the jailer looked on and, and said, what in the world is happening here? Some of you are here and you're wondering, you're looking on to the presence of God and when you sense it, there's something in the atmosphere happening. I'm telling you, there is God in heaven praises of his people. Can I just encourage you one more time to lift up your faith, lift up your hands, let God go before you, let God fight your battle. Come on church, praise him. Hallelujah. our trials, our anxieties. God, it's just better to just praise you and watch you go before us, to bow down and surrender to you and watch you fight our battles. God, we thank you and we declare it's better surrender to you. It is better to praise you and let you go before us. God, open every heart and ear to hear today. You're speaking, Holy Spirit, throughout this worship, throughout the scriptures and the word. I believe have a word for every person so God help us to lean in and to grab hold of the truth that you have for every one of us in Jesus name come on church let God inhabit those praises one more time come on church hallelujah we thank you God
And uh, I, I'm just so excited what God is stirring in you. And it's, it's the final installment, but it doesn't have to stop, right? I really hope that God shifted something at Discovery Church, that God shifted something in your life, that you're just a new, new kind of Christian. You're a new kind of disciple that actually, you know, does, it's not about religion and doing things and coming to church and all that stuff. It's, it's what God always intended. It's a relationship with him, it's such a dynamic relationship that we walk with him. And he talks to us deep into our hearts, and we follow his voice. Man, uh, and that's what Jesus wanted. That's what he always intended our relationship to look like between him and us. Let's look at it one more time. John chapter 10, our theme verse, it says, The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep. And I love this phrase, they listen to his voice. We've been doing 21 days of prayer, tuning in and setting an appointment with God you know, leaning into his voice and even journaling, writing down what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. Hey, the journaling doesn't need to stop, right? I mean, you guys have been writing down some things. Man, that doesn't need to stop after the series and after the 21 days. We serve a speaking God. And what we've been learning in this series is that God does not have a speaking problem. What we've learned is that we actually have a hearing problem. And so we got to figure out the things that are, that are affecting us from hearing the voice of God because he says he calls. He's calling he calls his own sheep by name. So he's not just talking to all of us. He's talking to each one of us individually. He wants to lead just you, like speak to just you and lead them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they have this innate ability. They, they know his voice, and they'll never follow a stranger, though. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. And we're gonna, what we're going to learn about today is uh, that the devil actually has a voice too, and he likes to speak as well, okay? And sometimes he even comes disguised as an angel of light. So what do we, the question today is, is recognizing. How do we recognize when it's God's voice speaking to us, and, or, or is it an angel of light, or is it, is it just us? Is it me? Is it some, my own soul, my own emotions, or is it the sushi I left in the fridge overnight? It's just what is this? That's moving me and stirring me, and uh, I'm going to help you out with, with that. So I hope by this time, though, by this point in the series, if you've missed any of them, you can go online and check them out. But if you've missed any of them, um, I hope by now you're starting to tune in. And you're starting to pick up on his voice and the promptings of the Holy Spirit. So now that you hear him speaking, um, the question is like, what? What do we do? I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where someone has, has maybe given you a word, like as, as someone like they felt led by the Holy Spirit or something, they felt a prompting and gave you a word. We call that like a prophetic word or something. Ever, anyone spoke into your life like, like that? So here at Discovery, we believe in all the gifts of the Holy Spirit and all the operations of the Holy Spirit. So that does happen. I've been really fortunate to have throughout my faith journey for the, the words and the prophetic words even that were spoken into me by mature spiritual leaders were just very life-giving, very encouraging, life-giving words that just, they just breathed into me life. They, they really did, but it didn't always, it wasn't always life-giving. Sometimes I got some words that were like, come on, man, that was not God, okay? You know, you know what I'm talking about? You know, you know what I'm talking about? Where someone, they're meaning to do well, but they kind of speak out just, and, and I've, I've, you know, heard a lot of horror stories. I've even seen some, my, my wife as a pastor's wife, you know, it's kind of rough doing that. Sometimes people give, I've got, you know, God gave me a word. He put his hand on me, did a handshaking thing. Oh, he was tuning in, man. He gave me this word. It was just, it was just so off, man. I, I just let him go, you know, I was like, okay. And, and, and afterwards I just, hey, um, thank you so much, brother, but you miss God on that one. I just want, and, and sometimes we do, and honestly, sometimes, and some people say, well, that stuff should never happen where people, that, that should never happen in church. Honestly, it kind of has to happen. It does. Because if we're all going to posture ourselves in such a way that we want God to speak to us and we want to respond to his voice, look, none of us are perfect. We're going we're gonna to miss it and get it wrong sometimes. But there has to be, how did I, how did I know that that wasn't God? Okay? How, how can we know when, when what we're hearing or what we're feeling and sensing deep in our hearts, wherever it's come, how can we, what's the filter? What's the test we need a test because none of us are perfect. No one is. Even Peter, Peter, 
Jesus asked Peter and the whole group of disciples, he, was, he asked them, who do, who do you say that I am? Peter stands up. You remember the story? And he says, you are the Messiah. You're the Christ. And, and Jesus looks at him and goes, whoa, Peter, no one could have, there's no way you could have known that unless God revealed that to you. God spoke to you, Peter. And then moments later, it was literally minutes later, Jesus starts talking about his death. And Peter rises up, uh-uh, you're no way you're not gonna, you're not gonna die. And Jesus stands up again and points me, get thee behind me, Satan. From one moment to the next, Peter went from hearing from heaven to literally hearing from hell. Okay, so nobody's perfect. And so what do we do about that? What do we do? Because it's hard. It's hard to recognize and discern the voice of God sometimes. Well, there needs to be a test. And first John actually talks about that. First John chapter four, verse one. In your notes are up here on the screen. It says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit. Okay, so every prompting, every word, every compelling, you know, don't believe it just because you felt it, just because it happened one time. And no, don't believe every spirit, but test, notice the plural here, test the spirits, the spirits, because there's a Holy Spirit speaking, but there are also other spirits speaking as well. I know you, you, you think you're hearing from God, but you miss it, okay? There's a spirit, there's a spirit going on there, but it's just not the, the Holy Spirit. I told you guys a story, I think last week or the week before about, honestly, it was a different church, but a guy came to me, literally said, I feel like God is leading me to, and he, began, he said something that was just like, you got to be kidding. He said, I feel like God is leading me to leave my wife and marry his mistress. I feel like I'm supposed to be with this person. This isn't the person I'm supposed to be with. And I, I had to, wanted to, you ever see the Batman and Robin meme where Batman is just smacking the crud out of Robin? I felt like just uh, reliving that. It just pictured in my mind, like, you got to be kidding me, man. That is, you, you, and oh, it feels right, though. I'm sure it does feel right. I'm sure you're feeling something. I'm sure you're feeling some spirit. It just ain't the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you're feeling it. It's spiritual. It feels, but it's just not, it's, it's something different. And actually, Proverbs 14 and 12 says, there is a way that feels right. It feels right, looks right, appears. There is a way that appears to be right, because God wants me happy, right? Which, by the way, there is no verse in the entire Bible that says that God wants you happy. No, God doesn't want you happy. He wants you holy. That's what he wants, okay? So there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it'll kill you. It leads, it leads to death. So what do we do about that, guys? What do we do? As, as human as we are, we got to have a test. There has to be a filter that we process every spirit, every, ta- every, every word, every prompting through. So today, what I want to do is give you the test give you that there's four tests, four filters that you need to pass everything through in order to have confidence that you are hearing from the voice of God. And it's, and listen, it's not just one or two. You don't just use one or two tests. You use every one of the tests to be confident that you're hearing from the voice of God. Take some notes. I really hope this is going to help you in your journey of faith and hearing from God. You guys, here's number one. And we got to start here because this is, this is like foundational. This is the foundation. Number one, does it line up with the Bible? That's the first question. Does it line up with the Bible? So let me say it this way. God's voice will never contradict God's word. Okay, you hear me, church? His voice, what he's saying, to, so he's not going to tell you one thing that contradicts what his word has already written about. His voice will never contradict his word, which if you're reading the one-year Bible with me, and you're reading that as your, as your daily reading time, we had this last week, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, that actually talks about the gift of prophecy. And the Bible is clear that the, the prophetic gift, that prophecy is giving to strengthen, encourage, and comfort. Any other prophetic word, especially a prophetic word that brings condemnation, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You hear a word, you filter it through the Bible, sorry, that's not from God. God does not speak condemnation into my life. You're hearing from something else, person. Sister, brother, you miss God. You missed it, okay? All right, does it line up? Does, that's got, does it line up with the, with the Bible? Let me give you an example, and not to pick on this like, specific life situation example, but it's just an example. Matthew 19, um, the Pharisees came and kind of tried to test Jesus they did this often, but they came and tried to test him, and they asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every 
reason, and Jesus didn't even answer the question. He, didn't, he just said, why are you asking me? Haven't you read? Like, what's, why, are you ask, what are you, why are you asking me? Haven't you read? And then he begins to quote Genesis in the Bible. He's saying, what, what do you think? Why do you want my opinion when it's already been written? People will come up to me often and ask me questions like, what do I believe? Like, oh, what do you think about this, Pastor Jason? A lot of times it's, it's, it's younger people because 20, yeah, 20 to 30 years ago, you know, we, we, call, we used to call things sin that we don't call sin anymore 20, 30 years ago. And I'm not saying like, like but it brings a lot of confusion. And so I get the question like, what do you think about this, Pastor? What do you think about this? And whatever hot topic or whatever. And my answer is this, is Jesus, what he, what, how he answered what do you think my opinion on the matter has anything to do with it? It is written. It's written. Like, like it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what I think. Your opinion, my opinion on the matter doesn't matter. It is, and I just point people back, back to the Bible. What does the Bible say? It is written. It's written, okay? That's what, by the way, that's what makes him God. That's what makes him God. He has, he has the right to say what is wrong and what is right because he's God, I'm not God. My opinion doesn't matter. It is what? Written. It's written, you guys. And that's just pointing it back. It is written. Look what Jesus said in Luke 21, 33. He said, and though all heaven and earth shall pass away, watch this, yet my words remain forever true. Hey, truth may change as culture changes. Hey, what, what we used to call sin may not be called a sin anymore by some people. What was right then may be wrong now. What is wrong then may have been right then. It, you know what? It, what is true to you may be true to the other person. Depending, but God's word is forever true. Forever true. And so when I'm testing the spirit, the feeling, the prompting, the word, I need to first pass it by, does it line up with the Bible? Which a lot of people you got to be careful. You can't take just one verse and out of context. And, and just and anyone can twist the Bible. You know that, right? They just take one verse, and you can make it kind of say what you want it to say. In, in theology, this is called the whole counsel of God. That's what this is called, the whole counsel of God. It is when you take all of the scriptures on that subject matter, you take all of what God has to say in the entire Bible, you bring it together to form your theology and your thought instead of one verse out of context, the whole counsel of God. Anyone can do that. Anyone can just take a little verse here and, and make up their own little, which, by the way, the devil did do. Didn't he do that in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4? He, when Jesus was led in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, the devil shows up at the end of his fasting, and he, which is hilarious to me, that the devil quotes the word, trying to tempt the word of God with the word of God, you know, he's the word. He is the living word of God, and he's tempting him and testing him with the word of God. And what does Jesus do? The, the devil twists scripture. He uses it out of context. And, he's try, and, and what does Jesus do? He gives more scripture. Now, uh, devil, it is written. It is written. It is written. Okay? So that's the first test that, that we need to realize. Every word, every prompting, everything needs to pass through the first test, the first filter. Does it line up with the Bible? All right, here's the second test. Write it down. Number two, will it make me more like Christ? Will this make me more like Christ? So with a thing I'm feeling, if I follow through with it, if I, will, it, will, it will this action or thing make me more like Jesus or less like Jesus? Okay, um, which I want to throw out there that this right here, this is God's goal for every person who's a Christian. God's goal for your life is to make you like his son, to conform you into the image of his son, whom he loves. This is God's goal. And, and, and let me clarify here. Please don't make it your goal before salvation, before becoming a Christian, okay? Because you, you got to meet Jesus, fall in love with Jesus, surrender your life to Jesus to have the power to live like Jesus. It doesn't work. It, uh, so let me say it this way. You, you don't get your act together, then come to Jesus, you come to Jesus so you can get your act together. Don't get that, don't get that, you, you, don't get it twisted. Okay, salvation is free. It is free, okay? We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. It is free. But everyone who has surrendered their life to God, if that's you today, the God's goal for your life is for you to become like Jesus. That's everything here. So everything in your life needs to pass that filter. Is this 
leading me to Christ likeness, which, by the way, discovery has two primary ways we help you do this to lead you into Christ likeness, to becoming more like Jesus. The first way is through our next step experiences. We have three classes we do every month step one, step two, step three. If you haven't taken them, that is the, the foundation, foundational to helping you become like Christ. We'll help you not only connect to the church, but connect to who you are in Christ and what he's called you to do. And then the second thing to help lead you to Christ-like maturity is small groups. I love small groups, man. You can probably be a, a good Christian in theory until you get other relationships around you, okay? Like, I, like until get some other people around you and see how you react and interact with the challenges that come. God wants to, there are things that just cannot be produced in your life until you get around some other believers and do life in community get into a small group we actually have our small groups launching next sunday they launch tonight at 7 p.m we have group link it's it's an event that you can come at 7 p.m to kind of see all the groups and the leaders and sign up for a group if you want to become more like christ if you want to partner with god in that take the next steps get into a small group check out philippians 2 5 it says in your lives you must think and act like jesus so I have this impression. I think I'm supposed to do this. I'm speaking, I think I'm supposed to give this word. I, I think uh, I'm supposed to send this email. Well, yeah, but is it acting like Jesus acted? Here's another verse, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We take captive my impressions. I take captives, captive my thoughts. I think God said to make it obedient to Christ, everything. To which some of you would say, oh, well, that's the problem, Pastor Jesus. I don't know how Jesus would act. How would, I don't, I just don't know how we would act in this, in this situation. Let me give you James chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. Gives us a, it's a beautiful, beautiful scripture. There's a lot of clarity on how, how Jesus, I believe, would act. Look what it says. It says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven. So if you want to know if the wisdom is from heaven, it's a word from God. Is it, first of all, pure? So if I do this, will I be more pure? If I send that email, will it be more peace-loving? That just deleted a whole bunch of them right there, didn't it? Yeah. If I follow through on this prompting, is it considerate? Is it submissive or is it demanding my way? Is it full of mercy or is it full of judgment? Is it good fruit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, good, all that fruit. Is it, is it good? Good fruit. Is it impartial? Is it sincere? What an amazing list to give us some clarity on how God would have us respond to situations. Will this make me more like Jesus? I often, as a pastor, I give this advice so much because I, I like leading people to Jesus, not leading people to do what I think they should do. I think that's one of my roles. As a pastor, I like one of my primary roles. I'm not, I'm not giving you the answers. I'm leading you to the one who has all the answers, okay? That's, I'm, uh, so... Often when I give people counsel and advice, I just, I do this. What do you think Jesus would do? And it brings a, an awareness into the situation. Years ago, I had a, a, a guy come to me. He actually called me. And his, his, his wife had cheated on him. And they were, they were going through a restoration process. And then in the middle of that restoration process, she, she slipped and cheated again. And so he was getting some advice from um, some friends and spiritual people too, some spiritual leaders too. They were saying, ditch that girl. Ditch her, man. That's no good, dude. You're going to get hurt. Fool me once. Shame on you. Fool me twice. Shame on me. Logic, okay? And he called me and he asked me, Pastor, I'm struggling. What do you think I should do? And I just, I said, I can't tell you what to do, but, but hey, what, what do you think Jesus would do? And it just brought, you know, and he said, you know what, Pastor, I just know that Jesus has given me so many chances and has been so merciful and loving to me. It's been unfailing. I think I have faith to give her another chance. And I said, you know what, my friend, I think that sounds a little like Jesus. Because quite honestly, the ditcher, get rid of her. I just, what I read and what I sense, like I don't see Jesus saying, ditch her, get rid of her. And he said, you know what, Pastor, I love this. He said, Pastor, I'd rather show up to heaven having give people too much grace than show up in heaven judging people too harshly i said that sounds like god to me come on church amen that sounds like that sounds like god to me now i'm not picking on 
like just marriage. I think a lot of churches make marriage their pet sin or something. I don't think if you at all are on your second, third, fourth, whatever marriage, know, listen, that, that God loves you, that there is restoration, forgiveness, and, and God loves you just the same. Please know that, okay? Um, but I'm just saying, you got to filter. I'm trying to give you the filters and the test. Does it line up with the Bible? Is this something that'll make me more like Christ? Is this something, is it foolproof? No, probably not. It's not foolproof. But that's why we have the other three tests, right? So let me give you number three. Number three, third test is, does godly counsel agree? Does godly counsel agree? Which is what this guy was doing. He was, he was coming and getting godly counsel, which I want you to write down, or after you write it down, will you circle the word agree? Because that's important, agree. What you're looking for, what I'm looking for when I'm getting counsel, is agreement of godly counsel. Now, let me, let me just kind of <laughs> disclaimer here, because if you go fishing long enough, you can find the answer you want. Come on. You guys know what I'm talking about? You go find the answer you want. You go fishing long enough, and that's just, you got to be careful on doing that. What you're looking for is agreement and godly counsel, and, and you need to use the other tests, okay? Does it line up with the Bible? Does it make me more like Jesus? Is this godly counsel in agreement? Because this guy was getting counsel over here and some counsel over here. What he was looking for was godly counsel in, in agreement. And I don't have the time to go through it, but you guys might want to write down, if you guys want to do a little study on this, 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12 is a great story on getting godly counsel and finding agreement in godly counsel. Solomon had just, let me just give you the, the, the 40, the thousand foot version of it, okay? Solomon just passed away. He had his son Rehoboam take over the, the mantle of king. The kingdom had already split under Solomon. Uh, Jeroboam had, had taken part of the kingdom, Judah, and, and, and it was split. But after King Solomon died, Jeroboam thought, you know what, this is an opportunity. Maybe we can bring the kingdoms of God together again and there could be unity. Jeroboam came to King Rehoboam, Solomon's son, and said, hey, your father put a harsh weight upon us in penalty and kicked us out. Will you unite us? Will you not treat us harshly? And he had an opportunity to bring the kingdoms together. And so Rehoboam said, go away three days, come back, I'll give you my answer. And he goes to the elders at first, the elders that served King Solomon. So wise, godly counsel. And the elders told him, look, and it was such wisdom. They said, if you become a servant to them in this moment and in the time of their need, they will serve you as king for the rest of their life. And he just gave them this amazing, uh, this amazing principle of servant leadership is what it was. But he listens to that advice, and then the Bible says he goes and he he goes to the young men he grew up with, and he gets their advice. And their advice was different, obviously. And they said, uh-uh, oh, man, you better tell, tell them that they think Solomon was all that and, and put a yoke on you. Tell them your yoke's going to be even harder. They said, tell them that the weight of your pinky and the width of your pinky is bigger than the waist of King Solomon, and the yoke that you'll put on them is going to be heavier as well. And he rejected the elder's advice, the godly wisdom, and he took some advice that tickled his ears is what, it, is what it was. And forever the kingdom of God of Israel was split from that moment on. All because he didn't line up with godly counsel. You just got to be careful. Look at this, Proverbs 19. It says, listen to advice. Like, go, go after it and listen to it, but be, be willing to accept discipline too. That means, that means you're not going to get it right sometimes. You're not going to hear what you think is right sometimes. And you need to be willing to go, ah, I missed it. I'm human. Oh, okay, God, forgive me. You're probably not going to agree with it all the time. But at the end, you'll be counted among the wise. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but the Lord's purpose is what prevails. Proverbs 24, 6 says, Surely you need guidance to wage war, and victory is won through many advisors. Again, this is why, again, small groups are so important. You need to, I was talking to someone just the other day, I think it was a couple weeks ago in this series, and, and they came back to church, and they, they hadn't been here in a, in a while. And, they, and I met them out here. I spend time out there after every service, and they said, oh, Pastor Jay was so good, man. I need to get back at church. I need to get around, you know, godly people. I'm just, and I'm like, yes, you, you do. Absolutely. You got, listen, you got all these influences and voices around you. You need to get yourself into a place where you got some good godly advisors speaking into your life okay is this helping you out giving you some good tests you guys all right here's the fourth test and i use it i use this one a lot too personally and i even encourage i probably encourage a lot of you with this one and that is do i have peace do i have 
peace. You know what's different about the Christian faith than a lot of other faiths that are out there? It's not, we not only worship God, but our God lives inside of us, right? So we, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, and we even, we even sense that prompting. We even sense the clash sometimes, right? We're our way, His way, and we feel like it's like there's a friction, a battle fighting within us. The Holy Spirit is living in us, and we have to learn how to listen to Him. How does the Holy Spirit speak, though? I'll tell you. Peace. Peace. He speaks with Jesus said that it's a peace that the world can't give. Like, there's not a pill that can give it. There's not a bottle that you'll find it in. There's not a relationship that you can find it in. God has a peace that the world cannot give. Follow. I follow that peace. The peace of God. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. says, for God is not the author of confusion. That's not God in that confusion. But he's the God of, say it out loud, he's the God of what? The God of peace. When we were getting ready to plant Discovery Church. We're going to celebrate our five-year anniversary in a couple years, but we're in that process, just getting ready to plant. A lot of you don't know this story, but we, we just the, didn't have the finances to, to do a lot of stuff, and there was just like holdups, and, and, and one of my spiritual leaders, who was actually, you know, a decision maker, you know, had a lot of you know, power, he, he, he knew the situation, and, and he kind of gave me another option in the middle of it, and he said, well, Pastor Jason, I know you got plans, but I don't know. There's another church, though, that needs a pastor, and I think you'd do good. I think you'd do good there. And he was the decision maker. He was the one that called the shot to put me there. And so I want you to know, like, immediately, there was not a moment that I thought, hmm, let me think about that. I just knew I had peace that God has called me to, to plant and start Discovery Church. But, but if I would have done the pro and con list, if I would have done what appeared to be right, I mean, over here on this side was, okay, it's an established church. There's a salary, there's a parsonage, parsonage, there's members, you know, there's people, there's people here. Over here, nothing. <laughs> Actually, we're in the red. We ain't got nobody over here. If I would have went through the pro and con list, obviously what appeared to be right, what seemed to be right was the, the easier choice. But thank God I followed his peace, right? And the rest, we're making history, right? This is, the rest is history and we're making history. Amen, somebody? Thank God that we, I followed that peace. And you can follow that peace. Philippians 4 talks about that. It says, do not be anxious, right, when you're in that process. Because it is. Is There's some anxiety when, you're, when you don't know, like, is it right or left? Do I say it? Do I not? Where do I go? What do I do? It could be in that process, God is saying, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, Present your request to God, and this is how you're going to know that God is in it. And the God of peace, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. That word in the Greek right there, it means human reasoning. It transcends the, listen, it transcends the pro-con list. It transcends what appears to be right, what feels right. It just goes beyond all human reasoning. That peace of God, he said, will guard your heart. You know, the the Greek word for guard there is a military term. It means garrison or army. God is saying, I'll put a garrison of peace around your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, everybody look up here. Please, real quick, look at my eyes. Church, I want this so bad for you that no matter what situation that you are in, no matter what trial, what difficulty, what storm, what season, that you would have this sense of a garrison of peace around your heart, though no matter what is happening, that you would just have a sense of a garrison, an army of peace guarding your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. God wants you to have that. He wants to lead you by that peace. Can I get a better amen right there, somebody? Do I have peace? Do I have peace, you guys? I want to close the series with some final thoughts, man. It was, it's hard. You, and I'm so excited for where we're going, but it's hard to close this one, this series. It really is. Because I see what God is doing. I see it like I see it and I hear you, a lot of you. But I also see it. Spirit, I see it. I see what God is doing. And so I want to encourage you not to, not to leave this season. We're changing the series, but don't, don't, don't. How I, so I was praying, how do I, what can I leave you with to have this be lasting? And I thought that 
that uh, we began with the same thought frequency in part one. If you missed it, in part one, what we did is we, we kind of began with this thought of the frequency waves. And what we did is we played from the, the sound PA system. We, we played what's called a mis- mosquito frequency. And only certain ears can hear that, right? Embarrass some of us. I'm sorry about that. But it, only certain ears can hear that, the frequency. And so the, the thought is like God's speaking. He's out there. The frequency wave of God, it's just we're not grabbing the right one. We're not, we're not grabbing the right, the right frequency, but there's another definition for frequency. I was, and the Lord was speaking to me this week about it. The other definition is the rate at which something is repeated over time. So here's, here's what I'd like to leave you with. is not only to be tuned into the right frequency, but to do it with frequency. To be consistently faithful at hearing the voice of God in your walk with Him. So not only are we, do we grab the right frequency, but we're doing it with frequency. Are you with me, church? Okay, so let me give you just three final thoughts to just, I hope, change the way we do life and walk with Jesus. Number one, tune into God, church, every day. Every day, tune into God. So the goal of your quiet time is not to check off your devotion box. It's not to, oh, I finished my prayer, finished my, my, my reading. That's not the goal. Change the goal, okay? Change the, the goal isn't to check the box. The goal is to tune into God, okay? That's the whole goal of your devotion time, of why you spend time. It's not to complete a task. Change the win. The win is no longer, oh, I completed my devotion. The win needs to be how well you tuned into God. That's the win. Can, amen, church? Tune into God every day. Here's our theme verse in a different transliteration, the message transliteration here, John 10, 4. He says, when he gets them all out, he leads them and they follow because they are, here's the goal, they're familiar with his voice. Now, how do you become familiar with someone's voice? You think about that. Like if my wife, if Veronica were to call you, my wife were to call you later on today and she would just say, hey, all right, you, you go, who's this? That's what you, that's most likely you brought, hey, who's this? Okay, but if Veronica were to call me anytime, anytime, any place, anywhere, and give me three letters, that's all I need, three letters. Hey, my response probably going to be, what's up, baby? <laughs> Something like that. What's up, honey? Why? Because I'm familiar with her voice. Now, listen, my ears are no better than your ears. That's not why I was able to hear my wife and you weren't able to hear my wife and know it was her. My ears are not better than your ears. Please listen to me. In the spiritual way, my ears are not better than your ears. On this side of the cross, in New Testament Christianity, you have the same potential and ability that I have. I am not special. I don't have special ears to hear. You have the same potential to hear the voice of God and respond to it that I have. Amen, somebody? This is, everyone has the Holy Spirit. You have it. You can tune in. The only reason why I'm able even to to recognize it more is because I might be a little more familiar with it than you. I've talked with him just a little bit more to when he calls, I know that's my Jesus. I know, that's the, and I know the stranger. It's because I'm familiar. So say tune in. So don't, don't only do that though. Here's number two, tune out the things that oppose God. So tune in to God's voice every day, but we need to also, what we're finding out in this series, we found out there are some competing voices. There are some distractions in our life, and we have to constantly remove and eliminate and reduce those things that are actively opposing God in our life. And by the way, you don't need me to point that out to you. You don't need me to tell you what that is. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you, but what the Holy Spirit wants to do is lead you, is tell you, hey, that's not, that's not good. That's not for you. Hey, this is the way. Hey, this is the way. Hey, this is for you. He wants to lead you. We need to tune out the things that oppose God. Again, in verse 5 of the Message Bible, it says, They won't follow a stranger's voice, but will scatter because they aren't used. Look at that. They're not used to the sound of it. Could it be that we're just desensitized to the voice? We become used to the distraction. We become used to the competition. I mean, those things... We, maybe years ago, you used to, things that used to, it used to hurt a little bit or sting. It used to take you back. It used to bat your eyes. You used to shut it out. But now it's just become used to it. I'm not sure if that's such a good thing all the time, you guys. I'm not. 
So we need to tune in to God every day, but we also need to be tuning out the things that oppose God. And here's the last one I'll leave you with, and that is to take steps toward what God has spoken. I believe God is speaking to you. Listen, it, God is not going to give you, why, why would God continue to speak to you more steps when you haven't been obedient to the steps he's already spoken to you? Okay? So I, I believe in this time and in this season where you are leaning in, I believe God is revealing things to, to you. He's revealing steps and decisions and choices. Respond to his voice. Take steps to follow God.